I had to learn more about Dr. Vladimir Kleshnikov and his compositional style. You've just heard representative pieces of sacred choral music from the golden age of Russian culture. The Cherubic Hymn from Tchaikovsky's Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom from 1878. Chesnikov's Communion and Salvation is Created from 1912. And Rejoice, O Virgin, from Rachmaninoff's The All Night Vigil from 1915. According to Dr. Vladimir Morosky, founder of Music of Ruska, the emancipation of the serfs in 1861 contributed greatly to the growth of choral singing in Russia. As idealists among the upper class turned their attention to educating the masses, they came to regard music as an important means of aesthetic education. Through church singing and the choral folk song, the two types of music closest to the populace, they felt they could help the Russian people establish an independent cultural identity. Notable among the factors that contributed to such growth were the ending of the imperial chapel's monopoly of new liturgical choral compositions and the establishment of the first independent professional choir in Russia in 1880. Generally, church music remained segregated from the mainstream of Russian musical development. Few composers felt liberty to experiment with new sacred compositions until the Imperial Chapel's monopoly was broken in 1880, freeing the gates for new composition by Russian composers. As Barroso explains, this provided this proved to be a turning point, not only for composers of liturgical music, but also for the music publishing industry. In ruling in Jurgensen's favor, Jurgensen being Tchaikovsky's publisher, the Russian Senate clarified the earlier decrees of 1816 and 1846 concerning the censorship process with regard to musical compositions written on liturgical texts. The Russian Senate's decision cleared the way for publication of numerous sacred works that had not been published previously due to the whims of the imperial chapel's director. Johann von Gardner, author of Russian Church Singing volume, Volumes 1 and 2, states that by the Russian Revolution of 1970, the art and culture of Russian liturgical choral singing had reached its highest stage of development. The political events of 1917 and the years following, however, effectively interrupted all further development of this art, preventing the transference and nurture of the liturgical singing tradition. In 2001, Professor Olga Belskaya Akhili gives her post Soviet perspective. Quote, the dignity and lyricism that emanated from this nominee chant, Russia's pillar of chants, inspired composers, conductors, and singers to infuse their singing with the spiritual countenance that was hailed worldwide by the early 1900s as a model for sacred expression. Since Lenin's revolution in 1917, Russia has been undergoing an almost complete destruction of its sacred expression and its national identity. The Russian revolutions in February and October 1917 and the civil war that followed saw thousands of white Russians fleeing the country. The white Russians were a large coalition of independent counter-revolutionaries all united in their opposition to the Bolsheviks led by Vladimir Lenin. Many found refuge in China, only later to be forced into a second mass exodus by the Chinese communists. The climate of Shanghai during the 1920s and the 1930s was that of a political refugee melting pot. <clears throat> Fraser Newman observes, the challenge facing the new immigrants in Shanghai was a daunting one. To begin with, they were stateless. The Soviet Union swiftly disowned the refugees, revoking their citizenship in 1921. In 1934, Anatol Kotenev observed that among the nationalities having no diplomatic representation in China, only the Russian immigrants come strictly with the terms of unrepresented foreigners. The Russian immigrants' communities do not mix with Chinese, and there is little possibility that they will ever become absorbed by them. The racial difference is coupled with a specific Russian Orthodox creed, the profession of which forms an integral part of the life of every Russian, form an insurmountable obstacle, preventing them from assimilating the Chinese. Vladimir Kleshikov was born on October 4, 1934, in Shanghai, China, to Russian immigrant parents. At the age of four, Vladimir Kleshikov contracted 
with the measles. Confined to his room, he was given a toy piano and began to play music from the commercials he was listening to on the radio. After recovery, his mother taught him notes for the trouble club. Just a year later, he gave his first recital in a public hall. It was in a nearby Shanghai cathedral where Pleshnikov was exposed to Russian sacred choral music at an early age. From 6 to 11, he sang in the Russian Orthodox Cathedral's choir of approximately 40 singers and learned the old Cyrillic script and church Slavonic. Pleshnikov recalls, there were 72 settings of the Cherubic Canon, so that the choir could go for well over a year without ever repeating itself. In addition to first-hand exposure to Russian sacred choral music, Pleshnikov was afforded private voice lessons, studied solfeggio, music theory, harmony, and counterpoint. Shanghai was liberated late in May of 1949, and Mao Zedong proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China that October. In May of 1949, Pleshnikov's maternal uncle helped the family secure the necessary documents to travel to Australia by way of a 30-day internment at an amusement park in Hong Kong that had yet to officially open. After the 30-day internment, Pleshnikov's family flew to Sydney, Australia. An arrangement was made for Pleshnikov to audition for Alexander Svajensky, the top piano teacher at New South Wales Conservatorium of Music. He was immediately accepted into the school and was offered scholarships to help pay for the tuition. While engaging in harmony and composition exercises in his second year harmony class, Pleshnikov's theory teacher described his style as a curious mixture of the Russian five and the French six. After a year or so of study, Pleshnikov entered to and won major competitions, and as a result was invited to play with the symphony orchestras of Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane and offered regular radio engagements to play live with the Australian Broadcasting Commission. In August of 1955, Pleshnikov, nearly 22 years of age, and his parents moved to San Francisco. He would go on to enroll at the University of California at Berkeley and graduate in 1958 with an AD in Medical Sciences and continue doing research in thyroid dysfunction and grave disease, co-authoring numerous research papers published in medical journals. While at Berkeley, Pleshnikov continued his performing career, playing at Russian Center in San Francisco, as well as venues in Seattle and Canada. In 1967, he joined the faculty of the New Way of Day School in Mainland Park, California, where he worked with a number of gifted students, including future television, film, and theater composer Greg Pliska. Side note. In 2018, Dr. Pleshnikov related the story of 10-year-old Greg Pliska's first composition while at the New Way of School to his teenage neighbor, Bennett McCombs. Tremendously inspired, Bennett immediately wrote a prelude using Celtic tunes of her own making. Dr. Pleshkoff said, this is the kind of teaching I like to do. Uh, Bennett may be in the audience here today. No? Sorry. Darn, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, in 1969, Pleshkoff enrolled at Stanford University as a doctoral candidate. Having no master's degree, Stanford made an exception, as Pleshnikov already had a huge discography, numerous reviews, and public concerts to his credit, in addition to world premieres of previously unrecorded works. He graduated from Stanford in 1972 with a DMA in musicology. Pleshnikov's recording career began with a chance meeting of Vernon Duke at a party in California, followed by an impromptu audition. Pleshnikov recalls, quote, I chose Rachmaninoff's prelude, Opus 32, number 12, against his wishes. I explained to him that in my state of excitement and the pressure of unstoppable ambient noise from the guests, that was the only piece I could handle adequately on the not-too-friendly upright. Vernon told me that my playing was phonogenic, and he chose me on the spot to be the first artist in the launching of the company. Then I started recording. This was a glorious experience discovering, learning, and putting out world premiere recordings of great works previously unknown or neglected or just not available in recorded form. Pleshnikov recorded for Orion Records from 1968 to 1976. In 1989, Dr. Pleshnikov and his wife, concert pianist Elena Winther Pleshnikov, moved to Europe and lived there for 10 years, maintaining a very active performing career. Quote, I played three times with both the orchestras of St. Petersburg. 
The press was quite intrigued by a pianist with Russian parents who had never lived in or visited Russia before, and who had close ties to the Rachmaninoff circle through his seizures. The press was also intrigued by our philosophy of music, namely art for art's sake, and the endless quest for the eternally elusive goal of perfection. Finding France to be overly expensive, Dr. Kleshkov and his wife decided to sell their home and return to the United States in 1999. They chose to live in Hudson, New York, and bought an abandoned Art Deco bank building in downtown Hudson, living upstairs and transforming the downstairs into a recital hall licensed for 300 occupants, where they hosted numerous world premieres, jazz festivals, and the like. They held concerts on this very week. After settling in Hudson, Dr. Kleshkov began experiencing acid regurgitation, and endoscopy and biopsy, excuse me, and endoscopy and biopsy revealed a virulent form of cancer that was beginning to grow quickly outward. After considering many different surgical options, Kleshkov and his doctor decided to pursue a radical esophagectomy. It was a long procedure, followed by 10 days in the recovery room. Quote, it was Christmas and I was the only patient in the ward designed for many. After intensive care, I found myself with all kinds of tubes going in and out, which were removed only after weeks had passed. I was too fed at first and told to fend for myself. The most interesting part of the story, however, had nothing to do with cancer or survival with my stomach being next to my heart. When I woke up from anesthesia, I was the composer. Apparently, my brain functions were sufficiently rearranged for that. I yelled for paper and pencil and started composing.
Augustine and lyrical true to Ken, likely his most recognizable work. It is from his liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and the first of his works to be published by Music of Rusica. Pusikov's Shurubikin shares a lineage and connective tissue with the slow, smooth-flowing lyricism of Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff's Shurubikin, with the soprano line moving entirely by step throughout the long and A and A prime sections. Pusikov's compositional style is eclectic, revealing Russian, French, and English influences. And at times, he moves freely between these styles within the same movement. As conductor Dan Foster states, they establish a tone world of all their own and function perfectly within that world. Additionally, Pleshikov incorporates some Renaissance and Baroque stylistic characteristics, but primarily exudes late Romantic and post-Romantic tendencies, often shifting schemas within the same movement. Professor and musicologist William Kerrigan suggests that his style started with a combination of Arkhangelsky and Rachmaninoff, but one morning he woke up and his style had suddenly changed to post chesnikov These are ambitious, complex settings in which intricate counterpoint alternates with serene homophony. The fact that the voice of such a composer is among us today, a man who is a living link to the great tradition of Russian composers, is a miracle in itself. In describing his own compositional style, Dr. Pleshikov expresses, My own choral music is exactly what might have been produced had there been no World War I, no Russian Revolution, no disbanding of professional choirs in Russia. The settings are often responsorial and produce the effect of two choirs without ever becoming two choirs. There is a lot of word pain, scrupulous attention to prosody, and occasional allusions to wind and brass instruments in solo parts. The style is post romantic, neoclassical, hardly mode, never sentimental or theatrical. The music is sparse and parsimonious, with a great deal of discrete, non fugal counterpoint, frequent groupings of three plus two rhythms in their variants, completely guided by the text. There are a few seemingly novel harmonic progressions, but they are derived from mode of thinking. Initially, Dr. Fleshikov chose to set biblical texts, mostly psalms at first. Then he expanded into liturgical texts. Pleshikov has completed approximately, approximately 60 settings of their four collections, the All Night Vigil, the Divine Liturgy, Communion Hymns, and Feast Day Works.
His liturgy is the focal point of my dissertation document entitled Vladimir Pleshikov, a historiography and analysis of his liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, and therefore will be the featured music on this recital. According to Pleshikov, in the early 1940s in Shanghai, I sang every Sunday's early liturgy as a boy soprano, along with two other boys of my age, another soprano and an alto. A side altar was used. Bishop John was always in attendance, watching what we were doing. I had a tendency to add to my soprano line some very small decorative passages, always improvised on the spur of the moment. The bishop knew exactly what I was doing, but never once stopped me, probably feeling that it was a form of prayer on my part. This was a wise decision by the bishop because it taught me reverence and respect, and possibly launched my metamorphosis into a composer some 70 years in the future. The later Sunday liturgy was very formal, festive, with a choir of trained, well-rehearsed singers. I also sang with that choir often as a soloist. The first antiphon exemplifies the vocal aspects of both liturgies on Sundays in Shanghai. In the first antiphon, a trio of high voices is heard first, all voices being soloists. Asymmetry in rhythm and meter appears in measure four. This characteristic is to become a staple in most of my compositions. Unpredictability and asymmetry are not arbitrary. The prosody of the text and the nature of the music's texture, in my opinion, explain the design and architecture. Ideally, everything should sound natural, flowing, inevitable, as if this were the only way, without the possibility of any other way. Asymmetry and unpredictability are meant to remain unnoticed by the listener. Next, in measures 7, 8, and 9, a trio of solo male voices appears as the counterpart to the opening, thus replacing three women's voices. To underline the contrast even more emphatically, the writing is in triple rhythm as opposed to the duple rhythm of the opening. The triple rhythm suggests to the astute listener that there might have been covert heniolas slipping by in the notice. All of the details mentioned so far were never planned by me ahead of time. I see them analytically for the first time only now as I am writing these lines. My music is not consciously mapped out and calculated. In this sense, it writes itself. My music is not contrived or forced into preconceived molds. However, I like to believe that the music presents itself in the only shape and form possible." End quote. Generally, however, Dr. Pleschkoff does in fact follow a pattern of beginning with a musical idea moving away from that idea and ultimately bringing the original idea back in one fashion or another, sometimes exhibiting a Ritornello-like effect. For example, his third antiphon, although structurally in A, B, A prime, B prime, B double prime, C, A double prime coda form, may actually remind listeners of the familiar Ritornello form from early Baroque opera, excuse me, early Baroque music. This slide shows the first statement of the regional light phrase in measures 10 through 13 with full choir, soon followed by a repeat of the phrase, simplified into SSA solo trio in measures 18 through 21. When we see this in just a few minutes, I think we clearly <coughs> hear the regional light aspect of this composition, possibly reminding you of the prologue, prologue from Monteverdi's Rofeo. Sometimes one may find a melodic fragment or other unifying mode from a previous section of music in a new section or even in a different movement, which one might call a large scale unifying mode. This is particularly interesting as Dr. Pleschikoff did not set his liturgy to music all at the same time, or conceive of it as one large work, but instead composed individual movements whenever he felt so inspired. The soprano melody measures 2 through 3 and measures 7 through 8 in the second antiphon of A, B flat, A, G, F sharp. It's found again in the Lord's Prayer, transposed up a perfect chord, in measures 6 through 7 and measures 8 through 10 as seen here. His music is predominantly homophonic, necessarily so for the purpose of clearly expressing the text above all else. He uses the novel occasionally and simply hits at the left hand. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I apologize, but I, I think I'm going to go back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, apologize for that. Uh, can we, yeah, you're on the right. All right. Um, excuse me. So 
So, um, for example, take note of the short harmonic sequence in measures 1 through 3 and measures 6 through 8 of the second antiphon. Uh, these two sequences, in addition to featuring a Spanish-like idiom, with numerous repetitions and fragments scouted throughout, show up again in the third antiphon, which, with one important alteration, arriving on a D minor triad instead of The soprano melody measures 2 through 3 and measures 7 through 8 in the second antiphon of A, B flat, A, G, F sharp is found again in the Lord's Prayer, transposed up a perfect form and measures 6 through 7 and measures 8 through 10 as seen here. His music is predominantly homophonic, necessarily so for the purpose of clearly expressing the text above all else. He uses monophony occasionally and simply hints at polyphony. Typically, his moments of polyphony are short-lived, featuring a solo voice above the rest in a canon-like manner, as shown in his cherubic hymn, measures 46 through 51. To allow you to hear Fleshikoff's unique compositional style and the connected tissue between many of the aforementioned works, particularly his unique use of the SSA trio, we will now perform large excerpts from his second and third antiphons, <coughs> as well as his, his, his Trisagion hymn, which features an SSA trio solo as well.
a usually well-rounded background, his music features a unique blend of Russian, French, and English influence. His style varies from one piece to another and sometimes appears to change phrase by phrase. However, within these changes, there remain certain compositional threads linking together this colorful tapestry. Examples of this compositional signature include non fugal counterpoint, Russian mutability, modality, half diminished seven chords, augmented fifths, heavy use of the deceptive cadence moving to the lowered sixth scale degree, large shifts of key center, i.e., C major to E major, and use of the SSA solo trio. Much of the harmony is standard and functional, but he enjoys the ancient sound and feel of modality, particularly the use of flat seven rising to the tonic, similar in nature to early plain chant, as well as minor five chords functioning as the dominant. Though not as prevalent, Dr. Fleshkoff, perhaps knowingly, incorporates the Spanish idiom in his music, much like Linka, Remsky Korsakoff, Bizet, Debussy, and Rebel before him. This can easily be heard in the first few phrases of his second antiphon, which was sung just a few minutes ago. Pleshikov's compositions, like that of many Russian composers, demonstrate a touch of non-Western practice by employing tonal or modal decentralization, known by Russian music theorists as mutability. Mutability is generally defined as a fluctuation between two or more diatonically related tonal centers, typically in folk and church music, as well as folk-inspired Russian classical music. This should not be confused with polytonality. Dr. Pleshikov, agreeing with this observation regarding this aspect of his compositional style, states that, in my own music, I do often mix two tonalities. For instance, C major and A minor used simultaneously, and also juxtapositions of seemingly unrelated chords, such as C major to E major back to C major, or D minor to C sharp minor back to D minor. For instance, in his entrance hymn, Pleshikov creates a sense of dual tonality, where both C major and A minor exist simultaneously. The dominance of C major and A minor are used. The subdominance of A minor is used as a momentary deceptive cadence as well. Pleshikov uses a similar technique in his Hymn to the Mother of God, pairing G major and C major in such a fashion as to make one momentarily unsure of which key center is really tonic. Measure 1 seemingly establishes C major as tonic, however, when arriving on G major in measure 2, G major momentarily sounds to be establishing itself as the new tonic through repetition until moving back to C major in measure 3. Again, however, when arriving at G major on the downbeat of measure 4, quickly we progress to a 5 6 5 of G chord on B4, moving to a G major triad. G major is fully established in measures 6 through 7. Pleshikov enjoys the use of the half diminished seventh chord, similar to Tchaikovsky in his liturgy. In measures 24 through 27 of the Hymn to the Mother of God, Pleshikov alternates between B flat major and E half diminished seventh over a B flat. Oh, 
the employee board game. And the last three measures of his Lord's Prayer, the bass moves on a descending tetrachord from a B downward to an F sharp, before finally resting on a low B1. This descending diatonic tetrachord is reminiscent of Baroque era devices indicating death, such as the chromatic brown bass in the famous aria Dido's Lament from Purcell's Dido and Anise. Note the use of the Russian octopus in Pushkov's compositions. This descending tetrachord is employed in addition to some distinct harmony, including a dominant seventh chord with a D to C sharp passing tone, creating a momentarily augmented sound to indicate an unsettled feeling on the phrase os lucado, or the evil one. Before we sing this excerpt, I'd just like to say that while I personally have many moments I find wonderful and even brilliant in Pleasant House music, these ten measures are my absolute favorite. It's important to note that this is the only part of the liturgy, his liturgy originally composed of 